Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner, and I'm here today with my pathology resident, Dr. Terrence Lynn, and we are going to do some more soft tissue unknowns. This is soft tissue set number four. There's 10 cases here, which I gave to Terrence to look at as unknowns with a little bit of clinical history. And eventually I'll get these scanned and put online. So if you're watching this online, um, uh, at some point in the future, there's a good chance there'll be a link down below the video description with some uh, whole slide images for you to check out. So without further ado, let's start with uh, case number one. It's a 57-year-old female with a lower leg uh, lesion. Let's see here, this is the lowest we can, lowest power we can get. All right, so we have our epidermis there, and then underneath we see a very cellular... I'll turn it around so it's right side up. It's kind of hard to do upside down. There you go. Um, it feels better. A uh, spindle cell uh, lesion um, that appears to have collagen trapping at the edges of it. Yeah, there is kind of collagen. The, the thick reticular dermal collagen bundles, these bright pink guys here, are getting kind of yeah, getting kind of wrapped around by these spindle cells. You can see the spindle cells stretching out here. I'm doing hand motions, but you can't see them if you're watching the video. So it's a bad habit I picked up, I guess. And then, yeah, you can see a little bit of the entrapment at the edges. So it's not very circumscribed, is it? It kind of yeah. like in this area, kind of feathers and trickles out. Right. At the bottom, a little bit more circumscribed, but still you can see there's a little bit of incorporation of that dermal collagen, that bright, those bright pink bundles, kind of trapped up into the tumor. Okay, what else? And when I was looking at the cellular component, I was looking to see if there's any mitosis, um, necrosis. Uh, it's very bland all through here. Like Your eye doesn't really get... Yeah, you're not seeing wild pleomorphism right. or anything, right? Yeah, no, no dramatic atypia, right? right? It's kind of bland, slightly plump spindle cells, kind of plump, you know, fat, juicy looking spindle cells. All right. So what did you, uh, what did you think about here? What was your differential? Uh, so with some of the things I saw, I thought this was possibly a gematofibroma, uh, like a cellular one. Um, then of course it also would be, if you're thinking it's a BFSP, which I don't think it is because we're not invading into the fat, we're not entrapping fat, we're not going into that direction like that. Um, the bottom is pretty um, somewhat circumscribed. Yeah, it looks like it. We can't really see, but it looks like it's starting to kind of uh, trickle away, right? Like right. It's the cellular stuff is stopping. You know, you never can be sure, but yeah, you get the feeling that probably the majority of the mass has been removed by this. Yeah, good. So that is kind of the main differential that people come up with often for spindle things like this. Um, and yeah, this is actually a cellular dermatofibroma. Good, good job. And the other name you could use for this is a cellular fibrous histiocytoma or benign fibrous histiocytoma, which is like a synonym for dermatofibroma. And when to call them cellular is a matter of some debate and is, is quite subjective, I think. But the way that, the way that I tried to learn it from Dr. Weiss is she really liked to see, and again, I'm hope I'm not misquoting her. This is my interpretation of what she taught me as a fellow, you know, 10 years ago. So so take it with a grain of salt. But the way I do it now and the way I tried to interpret it from her is that usually the thing that you want to see in cellular DF is not just hypercellularity, but actual like long fascicles that are intersecting together. And this is, I think this is a pretty good example because it's got quite a bit of very like very streamy fascicles of spindle cells, right? See how they're all kind of running together, you know, in parallel here, but they're not like, they're not like the 90 degree fascicles of smooth muscle. They're like fascicles, kind of like you would see in things that have a, almost like a bit of a herringbone pattern, kind of a, got to hallucinate a little bit to get that. Um, you can see a tipia in DFs and sometimes really big, like scattered pleomorphic cells. They're called monster cells. It's a benign finding. You can see mitoses. In fact, I'd say you usually will see mitoses. And sometimes it can be quite a few of them. I saw one around here a minute ago and I was trying to find it now, but it was from low power. I saw it. How did I... But I miss it. Well, there, there, it's it's totally common to have mitosis. So, and in fact, if you're between DF and DFSP, finding some scattered atypia and kind of bigger cells and mitosis actually kind of more in favor of dermatofibroma, paradoxically, rather than dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans. DFSP is usually very bland because it's a translocation sarcoma, has these very thin stretched out cells, and like you said, you want to see really prominent fat entrapment. 
DF sometimes can get down into fat, but the way they interact with fat is different. We don't really have an example here to show. The other thing that is useful for dermatofibromas, and none of these rules are perfect. The collagen trapping is great, but I will say that collagen trapping can be seen in DFSP sometimes and in other things too. So it usually is present in dermatofibroma, but it's not a specific finding. One thing that is somewhat specific, not totally, is this what the epidermis does. The epidermis over dermatofibroma tends to get elongated, reedy ridges, so it gets acanthosis. The, the basal layer often picks up extra melanin pigments, and that's a, a, an explanation for why a lot of times dermatofibromas are kind of brown. They're kind of firm brown papules. They um, clinically, I feel like oftentimes people will recognize them, dermatologists will clinically, but also sometimes the differential that they have on there is basal cell carcinoma or maybe nevus even. Sometimes they think that they're nevi because they're so pigmented. And the pigment is basically, these are not melanocytes, this is just increased melanin pigment in the basal keratinocytes. And uh, this one doesn't really show it, but sometimes the epidermis, when it comes down, it gets real flattened at the bottom, and we call that tabling. And that's a really good feature for, for the epidermal hyperplasia that happens over dermatofibromas. When a DF gets kind of rubbed and irritated, it will push right up to the epidermis, and you'll get kind of flattening or atrophy of the reedy ridges. And in fact, people often teach that you have a Gren zone in DF. It's one of those things that are always supposed to have a Gren zone. It has a little zone of normal stuff that separates it. But I see all the time where this happens, particularly in excoriated scratch DFs. I feel like I see it more where the DF just pushes right up and starts to squish the overlying epidermis and makes it very flat and sometimes thin. And it can even ulcerate out if it's been picked out a lot. Let's see if there's any better tabling over here. No, no good tabling, but there is epidermal hyperplasia. And occasionally, too, you can get basaloid stuff that looks almost like little basal cell carcinoma, and that's called follicular induction. It's basically hair follicle overgrowth that's being induced. The tumor is somehow making the hair, little hair follicle buds start to grow from the epidermis. So if you ever think you see a basal cell carcinoma over top of a DF, it's probably not a basal cell carcinoma. I have seen a couple basal cells over DFs, like true definitive looking basal cells. But usually for practical purposes and for testing purposes, looks like a basal over a DF, uh -uh. it's a, just induction of the hair follicles. So I think this stuff fits really nicely for cellular DFs. Cellular DFs can, uh, are reported to have a higher risk of local recurrence. And I think the, my view on that is that probably most of the time it's not because they're growing aggressively. It's because a lot of times they're big and deep and they go deep down in the skin, sometimes even to the subcutis. And oftentimes they'll get a shave biopsy. So of course, if you like just, you're taking the tip of the iceberg off, the thing's gonna keep growing. And so it's not really recurring as much as it is just persisting and continuing to grow. Um, anecdotally, if you remove most of the lesion, even if margins are positive, a lot of times these won't come back. But I have seen a few that did kind of locally aggressively grow back. And there are exceedingly rare reports of metastases from dermatofibromas. When dermatofibromas metastasize, it's usually the cellular or the aneurysmal type, the big, large, deeper ones. That said, I don't go putting in my report, oh, these are known to metastasize because it's super rare. Basal cells can metastasize too, but I don't put that in every report. Metastatic risk has been reported in, you know, one in 100,000 cases or something. So um, I, I feel like some people get really worked up over that, but I think it's so rare that it is not, you know, not really worth bringing up personally. It's just like one of those super rare case report things. And um, there is a, you know, Chris Fletcher has a series about them if you want to read more about that. So, so anyway, a nice example of cellular dermatofibroma. And people often ask, you know, is this cellular DF or regular DF? Is that cellular? Well, it's, it is subjective, but to me, this is an example of cellular. When you get those nice kind of sweeping fascicles in there, that's good cellular uh, dermatofibroma. And this one doesn't have it, but if you see foam cells, Teuton giant cells, hemocytorin, blood-filled spaces, those are all really strong clues towards dermatofibroma, not DFSP. So those, when they're present, those are all really helpful features that are often seen in DF, but not usually in DFSP. So there you go. And if you were having trouble, what stain could you do? If, you, if I go, told you you could have one stain only, you know, I'm cruel, a cruel taskmaster, and I won't let you have multiple stains. Only one stain. What would you want to do for DF versus DFSP? A CD34. Yes, good answer. CD34 is the one that I like better because it's very, very sensitive for DFSP and is usually negative in DF. But I will say, and I've got a video on, and I guess I need to make a separate video just about this, but I have a video about aneurysmal DF on my YouTube channel. And in that video, there's an image, a nice example of what CD34 does in a big dermatofibroma. And it's important to know about because everyone learns they're negative for 34. And that's true in the middle of the lesion. But out here around the periphery, around this outside of the lesion, you often get strong staining at the very edge. 
And that's because the normal dermis is CD34 positive. There's these dendritic cells that live in the dermis that are 34 positive. And the DF pushes them away, but at the edge, they get kind of kind of clumped up around the edge. This is my way I conceptualize it. I don't know if that's actually what's happening, you know, at a cell biology level, but I don't care. The story works, so I'm going to use it. And so what you do is get this halo of CD34 bright staining around the edge. But if you look in the middle, it'll be dead negative. Whereas a DFSP is usually going to be solid, diffuse positive for 34, very strong, um, with the exception of like the higher grade fibrosarcomatous DFSPs, they can lose 34 sometimes. So normally 34 is enough to, to solve the problem as long as you know to not fall for that pitfall of worrying about extra staining at the periphery. And normal dermis is usually CD34 positive. Look the next time you see a control, 34 normally stains quite a bit in the dermis. So that's the normal, um, normal pattern. Yes, factor 13A will highlight a lot of cells in these, but I've seen DFSPs with scattered factor 13A cells in them. I find that stain not very useful. And in fact, for spindle cell tumors, I personally never use factor 13A. I know some people do and like it, but I just have not found it to be useful, so I don't use it. So um, there you go. Now we've, we've beaten it to death, but it's an important thing because it comes up a lot. Um, I often will add a little comment, especially if it's a partial biopsy, that because these go deeper in the dermis, they do have somewhat higher risk of local recurrence, and then they can decide if they want to do conservative excision or just follow the patient. But I personally believe it's up between the patient and the treating physician. So, all right, let's see if we can do this. So this one is case two, an 18-year-old male with an intraarticular knee mass. All right. I, mean, I wish this is one of these times I wish I had these scanned already, but well, we can't have all the things we want because this would be nice to see from ultra low power. So I'm going to scroll around here. It's a pretty good size lesion. So what were you thinking about with this one? Uh, looks like a nodule of uh, okay. its shape. Uh, not super cellular. No. It's uh, very pink. Good. Um, so then I see like there's some cells in it, um, really some small vessels in it. Yeah. It looks. Um, but not a whole lot going on with it. It looks very bland. Uh-huh, good. What kind of what kind of cells do you suspect that these these spindle cells are? If you had to guess a category, what would you guess? Uh fibroblasts. Yeah, good. I think so. When you see a lot of collagen and spindle cells and and um, kind of hypocellular I always try to think of fibroblasts or myofibroblasts, and for practical purposes, I lump those two together. I feel like, I, and again, I don't know on a cell biology level, but I feel like fibroblasts and myofibroblasts seem to exist on a spectrum based on what they look like and what they stain like. Um, when they really have a lot of purpley cytoplasm, they're probably myofibroblasts, but I see some things that look very thin and stain with actin still, so I don't really know. But yeah, I usually vote for, for fibroblast, myofibroblastic category when I see something that looks collagenous in the background and has thin spindle cells. Um, and then um, the other option you can think of would be neural, because neural lesions can look a good bit like fibroblastic lesions. I don't think this one looks neural particularly, but I feel like it's fair to consider neural things and fibroblastic things in the same, in the same breath, so to speak, because they often do have a good bit of overlap um, in them. Okay, good. And we'll, let's look closer at these cells here. Yeah, I think these actually look nicely like the kind of myofibroblastic cells, kind of like almost like the cells of a nodular fasciitis a bit because they've got that real nice, juicy, abundant purple cytoplasm. And you might think, you know, someone might think, um, you know, smooth muscle because it's a pink nodule, but you can clearly tell here that the collagen in the background is what's making it pink, right? Not the cytoplasm. The cells have their own bluish cytoplasm, which is what fibroblasts and myofibroblasts do. And smooth muscle would actually have abundant pink cytoplasm. Sometimes if you flip your condenser, you can actually see the little wavy bundles. You can barely see it here, but little wavy bundles of collagen in the background that can help you tell all the pink here we're seeing is collagen. And that goes with fibroblastic processes and, and myofibroblastic. All right. So what did, did you have an idea for what the diagnosis might be for this? Uh, intraarticular fibroma. Or mm. like a fibroma of a tendon shape. Yeah, I actually don't know how to make a diagnosis of intraarticular fibroma. It's probably one of those like terms that's used for more than one thing maybe, but maybe this is just a, maybe I skipped that day of fellowship. So I guess that's something I need to do some more reading on. But yeah, what I would call this would be a fibroma of tendon sheath. And okay. usually they do occur like in the distal extremities, but sometimes they can occur closer to the large, more proximal joints. And I think one thing that helps me is it's hypocellular, right? With kind of fibroblastic or myofibroblastic cells. 
The background's either collagen, sometimes a little myxoid, depending on kind of how the age of the lesion, if it's a younger lesion um, or an older kind of more burnout lesion. I find this to be really helpful. These really thin, compressed, elongated vessels. I would say the word slit-like, but slit-like is already the buzzword for Kaposi sarcoma, which the vessels in Kaposi don't look anything like this, but I would say it would be fair to think that those look slit-like, but I feel like that's a buzzword that's already so entrenched that we can't use that. So I say thin cleft-like vessels. I don't know if that works for you, but that's what I use. Um, you may be able to come up with a better name uh, than me for that. So I think that those are a real nice example of those vessels. The other thing that these do, particularly as they get older and really sclerotic and collagenized, is fibroma of tendon sheath also begin to develop cracking artifacts between the, the, um, the collagen itself. So you'll see these thin cleft-like spaces that are artifactual, like this one here. And then you'll also see these thin spaces lined by endothelial cells. And for those of you at home, in case you're not able to see it well, we'll get closer. You can clearly see there's a nice thin layer of endothelial cells there, a little single lining of endothelium. That tells you they're real vessels. So this is fibroma of tendon sheath. At least that's what I would call it. And when these are young, like proliferative uh, lesions, the, there's a cellular phase that they go through where they look quite a bit like nodular fasciitis. And there is some debate whether some of them may actually be related to nodular fasciitis, because some studies have found similar um, uh, molecular abnormalities in both nodular fasciitis and some um, fibromas of tendon sheath. So that's an area that's still a bit under debate. So let's see here if there's anything else. I think that's all the features. So good, that's a nice example of a fibroma of tendon sheath, a pretty big one actually. And oh yeah, that's what I was gonna show. Where's the tendon? Can we see actual tendon sheath? Sometimes you can, sometimes not. Depends how much they peeled it off of it. But here, right there, that's tendon. This little, this pink parallel bundle of fibroblasts with dense, dense pink collagen in the background, that is dense regular connective tissue. And when you see fibroblasts with a bunch of collagen arranged in a bundle like this, the three main things that you think of is tendon, ligament, and fascia. And they all, to me, look at a close-up look, look identical. It's just a matter of, is it a, a thick thing tying two bones together or tying a muscle to a bone? Or is it under between the subcutis and the muscle? It just matters the context where you are. But uh, that's a nice uh, thing. And there's the, uh, for those of you at home who don't know this, the when you see spindle cells in a pink fascicle, there are three things that can be, not just, there's dense regular connective tissue, which is tendon, uh, ligament, fascia, that's number one. Number two is nerve, and number three is smooth muscle. And I've got a separate video on my channel that explains kind of easily how to tell those apart. So that's a little triad that I picked up from my mentor, Dr. Jay Rowe, one of my greatest mentors who made me decide to become an educator. So he said, those are the three pink, Pink spindle cell bundles are those. All right, so we've, we got good learning out of that. Fibroma of tendon sheath. Next case is number three. 45-year-old female with a three-centimeter kidney mass. All right. All right, so... Here's kidney, all right, yeah. Yeah, so there's kidney. Um, and then we also see that this mass is right below it. It uh, looks pretty well circumscribed. Yeah, can, can't get the whole thing in here, but it's it's like this nodule growing right on like the outside of the, the kidney, right? Right. Like here's like the here's the capsule of the, the kidney, and it was like just a little like marble sitting on top of it, or a little golf ball on top of it. And then the next thing I notice is that there's a component of mature adipose tissue. Good. And... There is also this component that is the uh, pink uh, component of this, which I believe is potentially um, a uh, muscle component. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it looks like pink and spindled, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I was looking at uh, was, are there any vessels, <laughs> any pleomorphism, anything like that? Um, See if we can find some vessels. There are some vessels in here, but there's a particular vessel pattern I wanted to show, and I don't remember if this one has it or not. I'll look for it for a minute and see. Probably there, that'll work. 
Yeah, so kind of a thick walled vessel here. Right. And it kind of looks like this smooth muscle stuff is kind of coming right off the wall of that vessel, right? It's like kind of wrapping around the edge of the vessel and seems to be kind of growing out of it, doesn't it? Right. So it seems like you probably know what this is. What would you classify this as? An angiomyolipoma? Yeah, good. This is a nice example of angiomyolipoma. And what, uh, do you know what kind of family of tumors this belongs to? It's related to some other entities. And they're called pecomas, P-E-C-O-M-A, perivascular epithelioid cell tumors. And it's kind of a weird name because there is no such thing as like a perivascular epithelioid cell. That's not a normal cell type. But sometimes these, cell, these types of tumors make epithelioid cells that wrap around vessels. So um, angiomyolipoma is kind of a special, unique type of pecoma. The other pecomas occur elsewhere in the body and have kind of a wider range of features and can look very different from this. But the type that occurs here, usually right next to the kidney and occasionally other places in the, in the peritoneum and retroperitoneum, is angiomyolipoma. And um, I think it's an important tumor to know about for a few reasons. One, you can easily confuse it with other stuff. You can see fat and maybe some scattered atypical cells and it's retroperitoneum because these can get quite big. And you might think it's a well diff liposarc or something, right? right? So, because it's got a fatty component. So, um, the, uh, the things that you pointed out is that there's three components. There's mature adipose tissue, there's vessels, and then there's this very unique appearing smooth muscle. This does not look like regular smooth muscle, right? What is, what's different about it? It's a cytoplasm. Instead of being like real dense pink cytoplasm, like, you know, smooth muscle elsewhere, the smooth muscle in pecomas, in, in angiomyolipoma particularly, tends to have this kind of, I'm going to flip the condenser to let you see, this kind of granular pink to it. There's like a grainy pink appearance, and it's often also cleared out. So there's kind of this clear, pale, granular, something like those words. And in each case, it's a little different. But this one is particularly like chunky, granular pink stuff and, and pale cytoplasm. And I feel like that is very characteristic of angiomyolipoma. And in fact, the other types of pecoma often have some degree of clear cell, pale cell, granular cell appearance to them. So um, elsewhere in the body. So that, that's a good thing to pick up on. Um, and then what, a, what kind of immunostains? Uh, these have a very unusual immunophenotype. Did you happen to read about that? Yeah, so these ones always like, I feel like are going to trick me somehow, uh, but it's the melanocytic markers uh -huh. that are positive. So it's HMB45 positive, mark one is positive. Mm -hmm. And then you can also obviously stain the muscle component, which, which would be uh, MSA or calponin or SMA. And I guess there's... Sometimes even Desmond too, yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really weird, right? Like, what the heck is going on with these tumors? I don't know. They're very strange, and uh, even the other pecomas that don't really look muscle-like tend to co-express their myo-melanocytic differentiation. They have myoid markers like actin or desmin, and they have melanocytic markers like melan A, mart one um, whichever name you like, and and or HMB45. And they don't always have all four of those. It can be in different, different um, components. It can be very focal um, as well. And um, to tell it, well, it doesn't really look like melanoma or melanocytic, you know, um, or really make sense to be that where it is and how it's growing. But also, oftentimes they are S100 and SOX10 negative, although some studies have found that some pecomas, I don't think so much angiomyolipomas, but I, I may be missing some literature on that. But some of the other types of pecomas can sometimes express S100, so that can be a potential pitfall. So um, anyway, that's a kind of a strange thing. And that's a thing that's common for all of the different pecoma family members, that they have myoid markers and, and melanocytic markers. They tend to co-express both, which is very strange. So, and there is, a, what was the other question on here? Uh, something about, is there a syndrome that these sometimes occur as part of? Yeah, some, yes, sometimes there's a syndrome. And what is that? Uh, tuberous sclerosis. Right, so some patients with these have tuberous sclerosis. You can also have them sporadically too. Um, so yeah, that's pretty interesting. And then, so these, uh, this is a nice example of angiomyolipoma. And I think I've seen, like I said, I've seen some really big ones. And one lesson I learned when I was a resident, not just for angiomyolipoma, but in general, is that when you see a large retroperitoneal mass, always think of the possibility maybe it could be coming off of the kidney. And when you see a large renal mass, always think of the possibility maybe it's actually a mesenchymal retroperitoneal thing that's growing close to or around the kidney because occasionally on imaging really large masses it can be hard to distinguish where the mass is originating so and you might otherwise not put renal tumor in your differential for 
retroperitoneal mass and vice versa. So I thought that was pretty good because I saw some pretty massive things in the retroperitoneum, some things that swallowed up the kidney, like liposarcomas, and I've seen some large kidney tumors that they didn't realize were coming from the kidney. So, so I thought that was pretty good. But I think that real take home is that cytoplasm of the angiomyolipoma is so unique. It's just like it's such an unusual grainy pink pale cytoplasm I find really, really kind of fascinating. All right, angiomyolipoma, good. Let's see the next one here. It's number four. And this is an ankle mass from a 50 year old uh, patient. All right, so one of the things that I noticed is uh, we have separate nodules yeah. of, of this mixoid uh, component, and then we have uh, fibrous bands, it looks like. Yeah, and you know what this fibrous band is, actually? That's his tendon, okay. or ligament, or fascia, one of the two. Uh, because see, look how uh, it's got that wavy... This is what I call the ramen noodle sign of Fulton in honor of my former fellow, Ed Fulton. Ed came up with the idea that this looked like the dried ramen noodles in the package. And I was like, oh, that's, I've been trying to find a good word to explain it. So I made a video about that. And now Ed's getting, he's getting a lot of fame and mileage out of the fact that he came up with this ramen noodle idea. But what happens is dense regular connective tissue, tendon, fascia, ligament, when it fixes, it, it, it kind of contracts up and, and all the bundles of collagen get super wavy. So we always teach that nerves wavy. Uh -uh. Not wavy like that. This super wavy ramen noodle in a package kind of wavy, accordion kind of wavy, is usually dense regular. And sometimes tumors like desmoid fibromatosis or other things that are collagenous can do that. But here, I think, just because I remember this case was actually an amputation, um, and I didn't tell you that, I don't think, but uh, that this is, this is actually just the background tendon. So does this alter your thinking, perhaps? Yes. <laughs> I'm guessing when I saw it, I was like, oh, I see the disappointment. So uh, let me guess, were you thinking of calcifying aponeurotic fibroma? No. What were you thinking of? I was thinking a, a myoepithelioma because there was like... Oh, that's a myoma. great, that's a great idea and actually a very, very legit differential. In fact, I think that's probably the closest differential for this tumor and occasionally I can't tell them apart. Um, actually, plenty of times I thought, oh, I'm not sure and then I did molecular to be sure. So, do, okay, did you have anything else that came in the differential for this? Um, the other thing is, um, like a mixoid chondrosarcoma. Good. And that's what this actually is. So that's, that's excellent. And I, again, I think that those two can have uh, quite a lot of overlap as far as their features go. And, um, so what you, I like how you described that. We got multiple nodules that have mixoid backgrounds. And in those nodules, you got these round nuclei, sometimes kind of epithelioid looking, depends, you know, but they're kind of round cells. So these uh, round cells in the mixoid background have a tendency to kind of run in cords and chains a little bit, like these kind of like form single file rows. It's not always real obvious. Some of these kind of seem single and clustered. Let's see if there's a better area with the cords and chains pattern. Uh, that's pretty good right here. See how they kind of hook up to their neighbors and they kind of follow along after each other and they kind of meander around through the, the mixoid backgrounds. And so that cord and chain pattern is pretty helpful. Round cells, mixoid background with cord or chain, think of extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma. And despite the name, it probably is not really like a true chondrosarcoma. They do sometimes have areas that look kind of cartilaginous, kind of chondromixoid looking. I think I saw a little bit in here that looked a little like vaguely, you can sometimes see like kind of lacunar spaces, but usually they do not have well-developed real cartilage. And they are probably not really cartilage tumors. They are, are essentially almost always occur in the soft tissue, not in the bone. Um, there are chondrosarcomas in the bone that have mixoid change, but that's something totally different. That's just a conventional chondrosarcoma with mixoid change. These are their own unique entity, and they have a translocation between the EWSR1 gene, the Ewing's gene, and a gene called NR4A3. So if you really want to prove it, you could do RT-PCR or dual break apart fish for both of those genes. The reason that you might want to do dual break apart to make sure that you know both the Ewing's gene is rearranged and what the partner gene is, is because myoepitheliomas, which can look 
really similar to this. They can have chondroid looking areas. They can have cords and chains of brown cells in a mixoid background. And like you said, they can have spindle cells and they can have sheets of cells. They can have a huge wide range of, of uh, findings. They also sometimes, particularly the soft tissue ones, they can also have Ewing's gene rearrangement. So again, the Ewing's gene is really, really promiscuous. It can be seen in a lot of different stuff. So um, that is a, a key. The other thing is immunostains can help that um, uh, myo, did you read what kind of uh, stains might stain myoepitheliomas? Uh, so calponin, mm -hmm. S100. Um, I don't know how to explain this one, but GFAP apparently. I know it's weird, it. right? Supposedly GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein. And you know, the thing that's kind of strange is that in the, like the myoepithelial related tumors in the salivary gland, they kind of seem to be a bit different than the ones there are like primary uh, myoepithelial tumors of skin and even the, I mean, of soft tissue and bone and skin. And it seems like there's kind of two different groups. It's much more complicated than we'll get into here, but they seem to have two different molecular backgrounds. Also, there seem to be some differences in staining a little bit. And the soft tissue ones tend to not express a lot of the typical myoepithelial markers. And all, it's particularly like the myoepithelial markers you would see like in breast myoepithelial stuff, right? Or, or in, um, you know, normal myoepithelium like actin. And those often are negative. So they're not very sensitive. Um, or P63, things like that. They can be positive, but a lot of times they'll be negative. So the, the kind of best combination of markers is the co-expression of S100 with either keratin and or EMA. So that keratin EMA, the epithelial kind of marker plus S100 is a really good clue to think of think of um, myoepithelial tumors when you see that. This tumor, um, extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma, tends to be negative, uh, if I recall, negative for keratins. I think it can express some S100 sometimes, but I think it's usually keratin negative. So whereas myoepithelial things are, uh, the vast majority are keratin positive um, or EMA. So, but I do believe that there, are, I think the last time I looked, there are occasional exceptions. So when I am struggling, I send for molecular um, because obviously the difference is big. So these can be kind of slow growing, but they tend to be persistent. They can metastasize sometimes years after diagnosis. I've seen some that kind of recurred again and metastasize over years and years and the patient was still living, but still dealing with recurrent and metastatic tumor. So they can be real problematic. And in this case, this was so infiltrated around all of the, the mass of the foot and the ankle that it necessitated an amputation. So it's one of the many things to keep in mind when you see kind of cords and chains of cells, but particularly, particularly with this mixoid background, um, extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma. Oh, look, I missed the whole piece over here. This is why you always start on low power. Look, I missed an even better piece and I spent all that time looking at the other piece. When here we have real nice cords and chains, look at that. And what else can do that is chordoma. Chordomas can make cords and chains and they tend to have more like epithelioid cells or more cytoplasm, the bubbly physiliferous cells, but they can look quite like myoepitheliomas. So there's kind of, those are all things that can exist on a spectrum and chordomas also stain with S100 and keratin. So telling chordoma and myoepitheliomas apart can be quite challenging, but you can use a brachyuri, which is gonna be positive in chordomas and negative in myoepitheliomas. So, so a good, uh, good tumor to know about there. That area is starting to look a little chondroid. See how there's kind of like little somewhat lacunar looking spaces. Right. But if you expect this thing to look like real cartilage, you're going to be disappointed because I, I feel like I've never, I've, I've seen one, I think I have one I just made a video about recently that had a little bit of stuff that looked kind of like cartilage, but overall they don't. They look mixoid with round cells and chains. So extraskeletal mixoid chondrosarcoma, relatively um, uncommon neoplasm. Oh, and there's even more, look, with really nice chains over there. All right. All right, so this is case five, and this is a uh, thigh mass from a 60-year-old uh, man. And you can see uh, we have a very circumscribed uh, lesion, very sharply demarcated on the outside. And um, from low power, you can tell the first thing you probably notice is these dilated branching vessels. Um, and the vessel pattern here, this has been called the the staghorn vessel pattern or antler-like pattern because the vessels are dilated and branching and sometimes they can look a little bit like the antlers on a deer or something. There you go, there's, you can see right there. So they are these dilated ectatic branching vessels. So um, if you're familiar with this, in the, in the olden days, the tumors with this pattern were called hemangiopericytoma, which is basically an obsolete term now. And um, we now recognize that this is a vascular pattern. We still sometimes call it the hemangiopericytic vascular pattern. 
And it can be seen in what the what used to be called a mangioparasitoma is now known as solitary fibrous tumor. And that's what this tumor is right here. But we can also see this staghorn branching hemangioparasitic so-called hemangioparasitic vascular pattern in a wide variety of other tumors. So it is not a specific pattern, but when you see it, you should certainly think of solitary fibrous tumor, but also synovial sarcoma and a wide variety of other soft tissue tumors uh, can have this pattern as well. So it's important uh, pattern to recognize, but do know that it's not specific. So how then do we recognize for sure that this is solitary fibrous tumor? Well, let's talk about the other features aside from the vessels. Solitary fibrous tumor has a range of cellularity. On one end, you get these very sclerotic, collagen-rich tumors that have relatively low cellularity. Those tend to be the ones that arise like near the pleura around the outside of the lungs. Um, and then the more cellular end, what used to be called, again, hemangioparasitoma in the soft tissue, um, they tend to be on the more cellular side, okay? The cells, cytologically, the cells in a solitary fibrous tumor usually are kind of plump, oval kind of shape. They're like plump spindle cells, so kind of more oval in shape or fusiform, some people might say, and they range from kind of oval to round. They're usually relatively monotonous because if you, um, I've said many times before in other videos that translocation associated sarcomas and and non-sarcomas too, translocation associated mesenchymal tumors tend to have uniform cytologic features. The cells all kind of look the same because they all have the same molecular abnormality. And we do now know that solitary fibrous tumor does have a translocation. NAB2 STAT6 fusion is the translocation um, that defines this entity. Um, and you can test for that. You don't have to do fish or molecular. Actually, there's a nice immunostain, the STAT6 immunostain, which is a very nice, crisp, strong nuclear marker that stains the vast majority of solitary fibrous tumors. So that can be really helpful. And these are often positive for, or usually positive for CD34 also. So um, that can help. But remember that CD34 stains many, many different fibrous or fibroblastic type of uh, tumors and proliferation. So definitely not a specific marker. Um, but it's pretty sensitive. Most uh, solitary fibrous tumors will stain for CD34. And there's other markers that people talk about, CD99 and BCL2. I personally just don't find those very useful. In fact, I almost never use CD99 except for small round blue cell tumors when I'm using it as a screening test for Ewing sarcoma. Um, and uh, in the workup of round blue cell tumors, for spindle cell tumors, I almost, I essentially never use CD99 or BCL2. So I see a lot of people do that because it's in the literature, but if you think something's solitary fibrous tumor and you need a stain to confirm, just go straight to STAT6. That's what I would do. All right, but back, I, I got ahead of myself talking about the translocation and the stains. The, the cytologic features, like I said, are kind of these uniform oval to round cells. And they they tend to be arranged kind of haphazardly in what's called the patternless pattern, which means they just kind of all kind of randomly arranged here. Sometimes though they can get arranged into little short fascicles or even almost palisade-like structures. Also in the tumors that are very sclerotic and fi fibrotic, have a lot of collagen, they can kind of create these little tiny cords or little chain-like um, arrangements of cells in between the thick collagen bundles. We don't really have a good example of that here, but this is kind of this haphazard distribution. The other thing is that there's a, is a variation in cellularity a lot of times within individual tumors. You'll have more cellular areas like right here. The slides a touch is a bit old, so it's kind of faded, but still a real nice example. So here, this is a little bit more cellular. And then look what happens as we get over here, we get some zones like this where it's a lot less cellular and has a lot more collagen, dense sclerotic collagen, all right? The collagen tends to be prominent around the outside of blood vessels. The vessels often, these dilated vessels often have kind of a thick layer or coating of, of collagen right around the outside of the vessel. And that collagen is kind of oftentimes expands out from the vessel. And so you tend to have collagen rich, low cellularity areas and zones adjacent to these dilated vessels. So oftentimes you'll see that that you'll have like this perfect example. Here you got a vessel and then around it, there's this like hypocellular sclerotic zone. And then as you get further away from the vessel, the cells start coming back in. The collagen pattern can, can be variable. Sometimes it, it tends to be kind of a thick ropey 
so to speak, rope-like bundles of collagen, but I've seen some where it makes kind of almost a, a floret sort of like starburst pattern. It's really pretty, actually. I think the collagen pattern in solitary fibrous tumor is quite quite beautiful usually. So here, this is a, you know, a nice example of the, the kind of thick bundles of collagen, and sometimes it's dense sheets of collagen around the vessels. There's some more of those ropey bundles of collagen. So that's pretty helpful for a solitary fibrous tumor, the hypocellular zones around the vessels with abundant collagen, the rope-like collagen, the hypo or the haphazard kind of arrangement of cells. See this part of the tumor over here is a lot more sclerotic and a lot less cellularity. So that variability in cellularity, I find to be quite useful um, in addition to the vessels and what the cells look like. And some of these, this one doesn't have it, but sometimes they can have myxoid change and it can be really abundant myxoid change on occasion and those uh, tumors can really um, get mistaken for other myxoid tumors, including some myxoid sarcomas. Also, I've seen some solitary fibrous tumors that have abundant adipose tissue, and I've seen a couple that had myxoid plus adipose tissue and really made me think of like a myxoid liposarcoma or a well-diff liposarc that had myxoid change. So um, those are uh, pretty good. I'll, um, I'll have to uh, put some uh, links in the video description down below of examples. I think I've got another video that shows one of those. Very, very tricky. I've, I've almost missed those, but thankfully thought of it at the last minute. And here again, look at this real bright, uh, abundant collagen around vessels here and thick rope-like um, bundles of collagen there. So a uh, very, very nice example of solitary fibrous tumor here. And again, STAT6 will be positive. So what about the behavior of these? Well, the solitary fibrous tumor is a little bit of an unusual tumor because it doesn't exactly um, uh, fit into classic benign versus malignant terminology. In the olden days, they were treated basically like benign tumors unless they had high mitotic activity. I think there's more than four mites per 10 high power fields, then you'd call it malignant. And that was the main discriminating feature. In fact, when I was in training, that was the way it was done. And that never really sat well with me. The idea that the difference of one mitosis extra would turn a benign tumor into suddenly being a malignant tumor. Right? I mean, what if I counted my 10 fields and on my on my ninth field, I was at four and then I go to the next field over and there's no mites. OK, so it's not over. It's not over four. So it's benign. Well, what if I would have, you know, turned right instead of left and I found that extra mitosis? Now suddenly it's malignant. So see, I never really liked that. So thankfully, um, newer papers uh, since I was uh, since I finished training have come out with a, a risk stratification model, which I really like. And I'll put links to those those papers down below so you can read about those. And that's what I use when I sign these out in practice. They're kind of are stratified into low, medium, and high risk categories based on a combination of the size of the tumor, the mitotic activity, whether or not there's necrosis and how much, and also the age of the patient. Interestingly, patients over 55, that's a, an extra point towards higher risk, whereas younger patients tend to have uh, be on the lower risk side. So anyway, you tally up points um, and you uh, decide if it goes into low, medium, or high risk groups uh, based on this risk stratification. So it's kind of similar to like what we do with gastrointestinal stromal tumor, GIST. Uh, the same same kind of concept of, of dividing it up into risk um, stratification. The low risk group basically acts like a benign tumor and essentially behaves very well. I think still that these should be excised with negative margins is the ideal treatment, but the ones that have low risk histologic or microscopic features basically are, are very unlikely to be um, aggressive or bad behavior. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, the high risk group basically behaves like a high grade sarcoma with very high chance for metastases and uh, potential death from disease. And in the medium group, obviously, it's kind of a mixed bag. So that's an important thing to know about. So I do think every time you get these, you have to do the mitotic count. Um, and in fact, I usually count uh, multiple different, I, tr I do several, I count 10 fields and I do it in several different slides in the tumor to make sure that I'm finding the most mitotically active area. Um, so in any case, uh, that's the way to approach that in practice. And I'll put, like I said, I'll put links to that um, risk stratification paper by Demico et al. Uh, really excellent paper, by the way. And I'll put those down below. And also I'll include um, down below a template of how I sign these reports out when I, when I actually diagnose this in, um, in real life, because sometimes it can be a little complicated to explain things that are not clearly benign versus malignant, right? So anyway, while we've been talking here, I'm just showing you around the tumor more because it's, I think it's such a mesmerizing pattern. It's just kind of hard to look away. Oh, and here, here's an area. And if you haven't noticed, Terrence had to step out for a minute, which is why 
uh, there's not any talking on his end. So these areas here, you can see the cells are kind of um, kind of making almost like that kind of cords and chains. Not exactly, but uh, I guess I'll have to put some other examples because just seeing one solitary fibrous tumor is not enough to really capture the whole range and spectrum of features that they can show. But this one I think shows a very nice classic features and I think it's a good one to learn on and to remember that this is this is what is meant by the staghorn vascular pattern. And they, and they don't always have to be branching. Look, if I just see big dilated kind of thin walled vessels in a tumor, to me that in my mind I put in the, the staghorn like vessels okay and i start thinking of things that have staghorn like vessels or the the hemangiopericytic type vascular pattern and i think of solitary fibrous tumor and again synovial sarcoma and other things mesenchymal chondrosarcoma which doesn't really look like this but does have vessels kind of like it so like i said a wide range of different things and other things that you could think of in the differential especially for ones that had fat in them you can think about uh things like uh, spindle cell lipomas which sometimes are low fat and have like almost no adipocytes those um, can have a very close uh, similarity to solitary fibrous tumor and again stat six will sort that out and also spindle cell lipomas usually have loss of rv1 expression whereas this tumor does not and then um, also occasionally you might think of something like um, if this were close to the skin and there was fat in it, you might uh, think of, you know, dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans might cross your mind. It usually has more of a story form pattern and not quite as abundant collagen usually or not the same pattern of collagen in, in my opinion, but it does sometimes have staghorn dilated vessels, particularly when it becomes fibrosarcomatous and um, gets like hypercellular herringbone pattern. And those uh, DFSPs tend to have really dilated staghorn vessels um, a lot of the times in my experience. So that's an important thing to keep in your differential if you're in the, the skin or subcutis uh, to think that, to know that sometimes you could have some overlap between DFSP. Um, and again, not this particular example doesn't really look at all like DFSP, but I've definitely seen some where there was some confusion there. So solitary fibrous tumor. And again, remember NAB2 stat six translocation and stat six immunostain to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, next case. And Terrence is coming back with us now. Number uh, six. 28 year old female with an incidentally discovered humerus bone lesion. And we're not really being fair because we didn't tell you what it looked like, how big it was, or radiographs or anything. So that's kind of not the way you would do this in real life. But, but this one has a kind of distinct pattern, I think. So it's fair enough, I guess. Right. So one of the things that I looked at and noticed was the uh, curvilinear trabecula of the bone yeah. itself. And um, there's just kind of haphazard with the bone formation. Normal bone wouldn't obviously look like right exactly they're definitely different sizes there's way more of them and they're smaller and kind of irregular sizes and shapes the other thing you can help to tell apart that they're not normal you know bone uh trabeculae that are entrapped is they're woven bone so when you go down to higher power if you this is where flipping your condenser can help you don't see any of the normal lamellar bone lines like you'd see in mature right. bone lamellar bone because even the trabeculae are made of lamellar bone Okay, but these are actually made of, you can see all the collagens just very closely haphazardly interwoven with itself. It's a little easier to see under the microscope um, rather than on a video. But so that is a sign that this is, this is new bone that's abnormal. This bone is not part of the normal native bone. This is, this is new um, abnormal bone that's being produced. So that's one little trick here. Okay, good. So what were you thinking of then? Uh, so I was thinking fibrous dysplasia. Very good. And that's exactly what it is. It's a real nice example of fibrous dysplasia. Again, in real life, we always want to know if the radiology fits. For bone, you always have to know the radiology or you'll get yourself in trouble. And there are some other things that can come in the differential with this, but this is a really classic looking one. So very, very nice example. And so you have these um, irregular bone trabeculae that people in the past have likened to uh, Chinese characters. But as, uh, again, Dr. Ro, my mentor, who is who's Korean, not Chinese, but, you know, he said there are no Chinese characters that look like this. So he's like, so whoever <laughs> described it did not know what Chinese letters um, or, uh, or uh, symbols actually looked like. So I thought that was a good point that he said. But, but the point is that these irregular kind of haphazard, weird looking shaped trabeculae, they are made of woven bone. 
and they also do not have osteoblasts around them, right? So a lot of times in reactive bone, like if you have a fracture and you're making new bone, you can make some little bone that looks like this, but it'll usually have a bunch of big juicy osteoblasts around it because they're laying down the new bone. But here the bone is being created. I don't know exactly if it's, I don't exactly know how it works, but the, the bone is actually just being laid down right in the midst of these fibroblastic spindled cells. So that's the way the trabeculae look. They don't usually have osteoblasts around them, although I will put out as a caveat towards the periphery of a lesion of fibrous dysplasia, as it kind of erodes and pushes into the adjacent bone, sometimes you can see some reactive background native bone trying to repair at the edge, and it can have osteoblasts. So I have seen that before. But And then in between the bone, you have these very bland, very benign looking spindle cells, and they have collagen in the background. So this is the classic, but there are actually a lot of other different variations and patterns that you can have. You can sometimes have hemorrhage and sometimes cyst formation, and um, sometimes they can be more cellular. There are rare forms of low-grade osteosarcomas that can mimic fibrous dysplasia, and that can be exceptionally challenging, and that's way outside the scope of what we're gonna discuss here because I still struggle with those kinds of cases. Um, but this is a nice example of a fibrous dysplasia of a bone. And let's see what the other um, questions are here. And I, I have definitely seen this before where it's incidentally discovered. Sometimes a patient's had it for a long time and then they have trauma and it fractures through it because it kind of weakened the bone. Sometimes they'll have come in from a motor vehicle accident or something and they happen to say, oh, yeah, you have a rib fracture, but also there's a lytic lesion in your humerus because they're doing an x-ray because the patient had trauma. So, so a lot of times bone lesions, particularly benign ones, get discovered incidentally in that way um, where the patient didn't come in because of symptoms. <clears throat> they were working them up for something else and then came across it. And oh, you can have ones, particularly like in the jaw, you can have fibrous dysplasia. Sometimes they get these really funny, like little, um, little round, like nodules of very dense, um, uh, calcification, almost like somomatous looking body. So they can really have a wide range of features. But I think this is a nice one to start with as a kind of a first foundational uh, look at fibrous <coughs> dysplasia. So what um, what syndrome can this be associated with? Uh, McCune-Albright. McCune-Albright, exactly. And I actually have a friend who is a bone pathologist who has McCune-Albright syndrome. And um, yeah, so that can go along with um, polyostatic fibrous dysplasia, so multifocal <clears throat> fibrous dysplasias, and then they also can have cathéolet macules and um, uh, endocrine abnormalities and probably other stuff that I'm not um, familiar with or remembering at the time. So those are the kind of main things I think of them. All right, fibrous dysplasia. Now case number seven is kind of a tricky one. Where is it? Case seven, a 49-year-old man with a lower leg lesion. We didn't tell you about how big it is, but it looks pretty big. Look yeah. at this thing. It's like a mile wide. It's like a, it's like a someone cut a huge brick out of it and it's still nowhere near the periphery of the lesion. Okay. You know, one thing that stands out to me here is this. These kind of cells are kind of plump, look like fibroblasts or histiocytes or something. And there's some foamy cells here. See that? Sometimes when we flip the condenser, it'll help us. Well, not quite today. But it can sometimes help you see the foamy bubbliness, particularly under the microscope. But there's actually a lot of foamy cells in here, like xanthomatous, frothy, bubbly cells. And like you said, there's not no dramatic atypia here, right? The cells right. don't look really specific, but they don't have much atypia. But it's a huge lesion. And like you said, it's ulcerated. So that always kind of worries us. But I will point out that although bad things that grow fast ulcerate, so do things that people pick and scratch at. And people have a tendency to manipulate lesions, particularly if you, had a, if you had a large mass like this on your leg, you'd be picking at it too, right? We all would. And so that's why sometimes it can be helpful, although this I was looking around for earlier. This one I don't think has, let me look under the microscope of both pieces. Ah, yes. So this is where the derm path clues can come in handy. Right here, this acanthotic thick epidermis has a real thick granular layer on top, and that's usually a sign of chronic scratching and rubbing, what we call lichen simplex chronicus change in derm path. So when someone, I see that in here, there's not that because they've scratched all the way through and eroded all the way down into an ulcer. But at the periphery, that tells me they've been rubbing and scratching at this, not just recently, but for a long time, actually. A couple other things. See the collagen trapping there? Yeah. Hard to believe, isn't it? But this is a massive dermatofibroma, a huge uh -huh. one. So dermatofibromas, 
are really important because they're common and they have such a incredible wide range of features. You can have little tiny ones that are really atrophic and sclerotic. You can have massive beast like ones. If I, I actually recall this case, I think it was like eight, it was like, I think eight centimeters. They actually clinically thought it was a sarcoma. They were very concerned about it. It had been present for many years though. Although that doesn't prove something's benign. I've definitely seen malignant things that have been present for years or that have been, I've seen things that have been present for years and then became malignant. You know, I've seen all sorts of exceptions to the rule. So yes, this is one that has been scratched and excoriated dramatically. And, um, but it has that kind of story form pattern of kind of histiocytes or fibroblasts. So that's why we often call these fibrohistiocytic tumors because they're, they're tumors that are composed of a mixture of either fibroblasts and histiocytes or cells that look somewhere in between. I don't think there is, I don't know if there's such a thing as a fibrohistiocyte, but if there is, I don't know what it actually is. But I feel like we lump together all of these particularly cutaneous tumors that have kind of histiocyte and fibroblast overlapping or, or mixtures. And the reason I knew that this is from the lower leg, A, I remembered the case once I saw it, but more importantly, when there's abundant foamy cells in a dermatofibroma, we call that a lipidized dermatofibroma. The other name for it is leg type, or I'm sorry, um, ankle type dermatofibroma because they usually occur at the lower leg or the ankle region. Ankle type, sorry, leg type is for a lymphoma, for a type of diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. In Dermpath, we get like a type for everything. There's like ear type, leg type. We have to love to do that. You know, that's the way our, we are as Dermpath. So, but yes, yeah, so when you see real prominent uh, lipidized foamy cells, sometimes it's so much that it can look like a xanthoma or something. And that would be another thing to think of here, except xanthomas are going to be all foam cells and really not like these sheets of non-foamy stuff. They're going to really be less cellular than this usually. And you can occasionally have really large xanthomas. We rarely see them in pathology, at least I rarely do, but you can have like tuberous um, and tendinous xanthomas. I think the tendinous ones they don't often remove because they would have to, they would have to grow in the Achilles tendon and they wouldn't go take that out. Tuberous ones they sometimes do, but they're going to be a lot less cellular than this. Um, I think sometimes people will get worried about this being a DFSP just because it's so big. But I would say also that a lot of times the clues that we use for diagnosing dermatofibroma and DFSP and things like that are not just the cells, but the what they do at the periphery. Seeing how it interfaces with the collagen or the fat or the epidermis are all helpful things. And when those clues are taken away from you, like usually when they, someone puts a punch in the middle, a punch biopsy in the middle of a big lesion. But in this case, even though we have a huge section, the lesion was just so big that we couldn't really see what was happening at the periphery. And I think for DF and DFSP particularly, those context clues matter to me at first more than what the cells actually look like. Obviously, I do go look at the cells, but what I start with is looking, what's the epidermis doing? What's it doing with the peripheral collagen? What's it doing with the fat down below? And I can't see really any of that here. So one way you can look at that is sometimes you get a little clue if you have a bit of dermis up here, you can see. Sometimes you can see if the epidermis has hyperplasia, which this does, but because there's so much ulcer and scratching like kenification or what we call secondary change, what the person has done to it with their fingernails, that really throws a lot of those clues out the window because you don't really know when something's been scratched a bunch, it's really hard to know what's actually related to the scratching or what's part of the underlying primary uh, tumor. This is a kind of an example though of blunting, or I'm sorry, tabling. See the reedy come down and instead of, this one's kind of rounded or pointed, but this one comes down and then it's like smash. It's like a force field of tumor, like that blocks it and makes it squish flat on the bottom. And I find that pretty helpful. Usually dermatofibromas have those. And let's see if there's any, I didn't see any blood filled spaces or hemocytorin. But the reason that I like this one is because most people never encounter a DF this big and it's just not on your radar after you've seen some during a derm path rotation or in a book, it's not on people's radar to imagine that a DF could be this big. I remember even the surgeons who were pretty experienced soft tissue surgeon who saw this, they were shocked. They were like, no way. And I was like, oh yeah, for sure. So the DFs can occasionally be quite large and the big ones tend to get, um, people get really worried. Oh, and then the one other thing is in these, these ankle type lipidized DFs, they often get these really dense homogenized pink collagen. This one doesn't have it nearly as much as some of them do, but the collagen, they kind of make their own sclerotic collagen. And sometimes it runs through the tumor and wraps around the cells and it makes like these kind of arcs and loops that swirl in between the foamy tumor cells. And I do have a video about um, lipidized ankle type DF on my um, YouTube channel that shows a much more, much more very classic example of a ankle type lipidized DF. So, so benign and massive, but, but totally okay. So good to know that that still can be benign even if it's huge like this. But I think this is a really tricky and interesting case for a variety of reasons. All right, let's look at number eight, 60 year old female. 
with a 3.5 centimeter mass of the lower extremity. I guess that would mean the leg, wouldn't it? And in fact, oh, we didn't tell you, but oh, I remember this one. This is particularly challenging because it's actually in bone, isn't it? And we probably should have told you that. This is in the, the bone on the uh, foot, if I, if I remember correctly. The, I think it was in the calcaneus. But, but don't worry about that because this is not a, usually a bone thing. It's just something that happened to be in bone this time. Did you figure out what it was? Uh, after looking at this and picturing myself in a different part of the body, like a lymph node, uh -huh. I thought it was um, just an extra node over the dorsum. Nicely done, yes. But and you stuck with that even though you saw bone there and you thought, well, I guess I mean, what else can it be, right? right? Good. This is a really nice example of something that's rare that you can occasionally have rosy dorkman occur in the bone as like a lytic bone lesion. I've seen it a few times um, uh, so far in training and in practice. And uh, this is a pretty nice example of it. So, you know, that goes back to when something, when everything fits for one diagnosis, but except, well, it's a weird spot or there's one weird feature. Well, it probably still is the thing that most of the features point to. And I think that's the one hard part of pathology practice is you will want everything to fit what it's supposed to be in the book. But oftentimes there'll be one or two features that are kind of strange. And a big part of the struggle of everyday practice is, is that weird enough that I need to think of something else? So, and when you do consult work, that's a lot of the consults you get is, I thought this was this, but I found a mitosis or I found an atypical cell or whatever. And it's people just needing reassurance that, oh yeah, the Fs can be massive or, oh yeah, you can have Rosi Dorfman in the bone. So this is... Uh, Rosi Dorfman, extranodal Rosi Dorfman, involving the bone. Let me see if I can find a good, uh, good area to show you here. So when you go looking for imperipolesis, the problem is you're never going to find a place that's good enough like to take a picture of for a textbook. And the problem is that there's imperipolesis actually everywhere we look here. See all these cells here? They're all sitting in the cytoplasm, but they're not that like perfect little vacuole that you want to see in the book. So I feel like imperipolesis is over relied on. It's really pretty, but um, it's not really like needed for the diagnosis of Rosi Dorfman. What you want to find, what I'm trying to find, is a really good example of the cytologic features. Okay, so here's an example. What, the thing I really want to find in Rosi Dorfman, well, for one thing, from low power, it's sheets of pale pink cells with little aggregates of blue. So pink and blue from low power. And that is, and usually you get to see it in the subcutis when it's extranodal. In the node, it looks kind of totally different actually because it fills up the 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 um, what are those things called sinusoids? The sinuses. Thank you. Um, I was like, you know, those empty things in between. That's, that just shows how little heme path I do. So um, yeah, but in the soft tissue, it makes a mass, usually sheets of these pink cells of the abundant cytoplasm and little aggregates of lymphocytes and plasma cells. The bone, it kind of does the same thing, although it can be a little bit altered because of the damage it makes to the bone. And in here, we're seeing some of those big cells with abundant puffy cytoplasm. They usually have large round nuclei, often with central prominent nucleoli, like this guy right here. And also, we got lucky too, because you can actually see some nice imperipolesis, if I can get it in focus here. See there? Here's the tumor, or the nucleus of the histiocyte, and there are some little cells, little white cells in there. There's a couple right here, and there's the, the, the histiocyte. You can see this little neutrophil. Well, all the stuff that's pink here we're seeing is cytoplasm. So that neutrophil is in the cytoplasm. You just don't see a nice vacuole around it. If you really want to see the nice vacuole, you can do, well, what, what stain will highlight these histiocytes? S100. S100, right? And occasionally you can see S100 in other histiocytes too. So by itself, S100 positive doesn't prove something's Rosi Dorfman. Um, and in really classic cases, you don't honestly need it, in my opinion. But I do feel like S100 will often highlight the cytoplasm enough, so the little vacuoles that the imperipolesis, the little, and for those of you watching this, imperipolesis is basically the when white blood cells, either neutrophils, plasma cells, lymphocytes, sometimes red cells even, they get inside um, the cytoplasm of these big histiocytes, and they kind of float there in vacuoles. And they're not being destroyed or eaten. It's not like hemophagocytosis. It's just there, I think Adam Bagg, a, a really funny and excellent heme path teacher, he once said they're, they're just stopping by for tea. You know, they're just kept coming into the cytoplasm and then, then I guess leaving. I don't know if they really leave. Oftentimes you see plasma cells. I just saw them and then I moved past it because my, my uh, fine motor skills aren't very good, I guess. But all of these... All of these plasma cells, plasma cells are almost always present and usually abundant in Rosi Dorfman. 
But what you really want to find more than anything is these big nuclei. You should have really large big nuclei with pale chromatin and prominent nucleoli and a bunch of cytoplasm. That's the cell of Rosi Dorfman. And that's what we have here. I would say one unusual feature in this case is the fact that there's a bunch of foamy cytoplasm. That is not something I typically see in Rosi Dorfman. And I suspect some of that here is due to like breakdown of the bone with some hemorrhage and, and the fact that it's in the bone making a lytic lesion that's destructive to the bone in this case. So I suspect that that's why, because there's some hemocytorin and some foam cells. So I imagine that's from bleeding and then the lipid getting taken up. Um, and some of these probably are not actually tumoral histiocytes. They're just background um, foamy histiocytes taking that up. So I think that's a little bit unusual feature. Um, but anyway, this was a pretty interesting case. And this was S100 positive, I, although I don't know if I still have a picture of that or not. But so a good thing to keep in mind, other things to keep in mind in the bone, when you see a bunch of foamy cells like this, you can think there's a really rare disease called Erdheim-Chester disease that can give you a bunch of foamy histiocytes in the bone. And the unusual thing about that, and I've actually never yet seen a real case that I, not that I know of at least, is they often have bilateral like mirror image lesions. Like they'll have lesions in the same bone on both sides of the body. Really weird, right? At least that's right. what I've heard. And from the limited reading I've done on it, that's what the, the supposed history is. So... I've seen something very rare, Rosi Dorfman disease. And when it's in a lymph node, we call it sinus histiocytosis with massive lymphadenopathy, although obviously that name does not apply outside the lymph node because that wouldn't make any sense. So in, in the bone, Rosi Dorfman of the bone. And I do have a, another video about regular extranodal Rosi Dorfman on my YouTube channel. All right. Let's see. Next, we have a 40-year-old man with HIV and multiple skin lesions. Let me turn it the proper, proper side up. So just with that history, you probably right away imagine what this lesion is going to be. Yes. Since we're doing soft tissue, if we were doing derm path, it could be other things. But so what do you think this is? I was thinking Kaposi sarcoma. Yeah, Kaposi sarcoma, Kaposi sarcoma, however you like to, however you like to say it. I'm not sure exactly the proper pronunciation. But yeah, right away from low power, we got some infiltrate in the dermis. And it's kind of patchy, variable cellularity, trickling all the way down here, okay? And multiple lesions in an HIV patient, never a good thing. It's, it could be capacity, especially if they're violaceous. Otherwise, you could think of cryptococcus or other types of infectious things, histoplasmosis that is disseminated, you know, depending on if they have uh, well, like full-blown AIDS or untreated HIV. So the, um, let's see the features here. Kaposi sarcoma. So Kaposi sarcoma can have variable features depending on the stage of the lesion. And the lesions kind of have three main phases from a clinical level, but they all do have different pathologic findings. Number one is patch stage. They're really thin, red to purple, but flat. Then they can get thicker and kind of become in a plaque-like stage. And then eventually they can become nodules. And sometimes the nodules, both either the early patch stage and the late nodular stage can be actually challenging to diagnose. The early stage can be challenging because it's super subtle and, and can be very, very hard to find the few vessels and to recognize that they're even atypical uh, vessels. The um, nodule or tumor stage is hard to diagnose, not because you don't recognize that it's a tumor. You'll say, oh, that's a tumor, but you might not notice that it's campus sarcoma because it doesn't always have blood filled spaces or the other features. But here, I think you kind of are seeing, this is kind of more like what plaque stage usually looks like over here where there's a lot of dermal collagen left and there's infiltrating spindle cells and vascular channels between. Over here is kind of progressing towards what you'd see in a tumor stage um, capacity. So let's go down and look here. So these vessels up here might catch your eye at first, but most likely those are not actually tumor vessels. Those are probably, this is, I don't know where this is on the body, but those are probably reactive dilated vessels or on the lower leg, it can be related to stasis. You can see vessels or it may just be reactive from the tumor. It's hard to know. Sometimes with the stain, um, you can tell. But this is one of the challenges here. Looking at this right away, you may not necessarily recognize that this is a vasco lesion, right? It's not right. super obvious vessel formation. But if you do an immunostain for CD34 or ERG, um, sometimes they can be CD31 negative for some strange reason. Um, they, the virus that, can, that, that causes this can downregulate CD31 expression, which is a strange thing. But they can be these spindle cells that are trickling through the dermis. And what you see instead of well-formed vascular channels, although sometimes you'll see that, a lot of times you see these little thin slit-like spaces, these little tiny spaces. And it, you, know, you can see cracked-like artifact that looks like that a lot of times. So it can be challenging. But a couple clues that can help us out is if we see 
red blood cells in the spaces, if we see extravasated red blood cells, if we see hemosiderin, see that little pigment right there? Let's go closer for the video, pick it up. Hemosiderin, that means bleeding has been happening at some point and probably for a while, right? So there's a little touch of hemosiderin there, it's a little bit right there. Here's some red cells. And then these little globules, these are, these the classic teaching is that these are fragments of degenerated red blood cell that's being taken up by the tumor cell. I don't know if that's totally true, but people that are very smart and smarter than me have told me it's true. But I also see little little globules and droplets of proteinaceous material in a variety of other sarcomas, so I don't know. But in any case, these little droplets of pink stuff, whatever it may be, is supposed to be helpful. And one of my fellows, uh, Betsy Ulenhake, um, she told me actually that these are called dwarf balls, D-O-R-F balls. And I did look it up and found like one obscure reference. And she was a, a very, very smart a uh, dermatologist uh, and knew all this esoterica. So I was like, wow, Betsy, that's amazing. So Betsy, if you're watching this, is a shout out to you. Um, in any case though, you know, areas like this, it can be really hard to tell them that there's vascular channels. Sometimes you can see little vacuoles. Sometimes vacuoles can have red cells in them. So that's helpful. But um, the other thing that makes me, whenever I see trickly spindle cells in the dermis with any sign of hemorrhage, I always try to think of Kaposi, even without the history, because you don't always know that someone has AIDS. Sure. Also, you can see Kaposi in other settings. You can see it, particularly the, the time I probably see it most is in old people, right? Old people on the feet. And that's called the classic form of Kaposi. It was originally described in, in Mediterranean old men or Ashkenazi Jewish old men. But we recognize now old folks of any skin type or ethnicity can actually get it. It's as you get older, your immune system goes downhill. And the virus, which is a relatively common virus, get, can overgrow and start producing this. And do you know what virus causes this tumor? HHV8. Yeah, human herpes virus H, HHV8. Exactly. And you can actually do a stain for that, HHV8. And there's another name for the stain, which I think it's always good to learn all the different stain names. It's called LANA1, L-A-N-A-1. It's something latent, something nuclear antigen. I guess I should probably memorize that at some point. But so in any case, it's really hard because this, this kind of cellular clumps of spindle cells don't really make good well-formed vessels. So um, one thing that I find helpful though is, let me see if I can find it where if it's doing it in this case, one useful clue, ah, there, is this. For whatever reason, the spindled endothelial cells, because all the spindle cells you're seeing here, these are all endothelial cells. If you stain them with the vascular marker, they'll be positive. And that's one clue. When you see what you think are spindle cells, but they all stain like with ERG and 34, or if you're lucky with 31, then that's a clue that you're probably dealing with Kaposi sarcoma. And here, look what they've done. This is used to be a sweat gland, a sweat coil, an eccrine coil. See, that's a little tubule of it. There's tubules right, right there. They love to infiltrate and splay apart the eccrine coils. So if you have an eccrine coil in your biopsy and I see spindle cells or hemorrhage right around the eccrine coil, I'll often do an HHV8 just to be sure I'm not missing a subtle Kaposi sarcoma. And here, look at all the little red cells here. See, there's little tiny red cells everywhere here. So sometimes you can actually see nice little slit spaces where they float inside. Or if you cut the fascicle, because as these tumors progress, they become more fascicular. Let me see if I can show you that area. Sorry, there's so many pearls and I'm trying to like teach them all at once. Ah, uh, here's actually a couple vascular channels. Look, that's probably, this is the kind of very primitive, immature, infiltrative channel right. of Kaposi. And um, that it can be very hard. Sometimes they do get more dilated and sometimes they'll wrap around. I mean, those could be tumor channels, actually. I might be, maybe I was wrong earlier when I told you they weren't. Because they do have kind of a little bit atypical looking endothelial cells. But um, sometimes they can actually make a, a little vessel that pushes into another vessel, and that's called the promontory sign. Like it makes like a little mound or a hill. But I feel like that's taught in books a lot, but you only rarely see it in real life, in my experience at least. So, uh, but as the as the lesions progress, they do become more spindled, and the spindle cells begin to sweep into fascicles. This one's not really doing it, but they're kind of a little bit of fascicle formation, and often in the more fascicle area you'll find little, the little spaces filled with blood. And, um, and then sometimes if you cut them, the fascicle and cross section, instead of little slit-like spaces, it'll be little holes. And Mark Edgar, um, one of my mentors, he taught me that that's like the sieve pattern or colander, like a spaghetti strainer, right. like all the little holes at the bottom filled with blood. Now you're never gonna want spaghetti again, <laughs> but it works. And this, this particular case doesn't have it, but I do have a couple Kaposi videos on my channel. And one of those has a real nice example of that. So anyway, this is a good case because it does show the range of features you can have. Here's a little bit of that. It's not real great, but you can see there's some little holes here that are filled with blood. But the reason is subtle. It is, there's no doubt it's a hard tumor sometimes, and it's really important to keep a high index of suspicion. The other thing is that they can make 
nice well-formed dilated channels sometimes. Sometimes it's very subtle little crack-like slit-like spaces, but other times they make channels that look infiltrative and can look like angiosarcoma. And telling angiosarcoma capacity is hugely important because capacity um, is basically not curable. It, if you have HIV and they treat the HIV, a lot of times the capacity will diminish or even go away as the HIV gets better and the immune system recovers, then the, uh, the HHV8 gets knocked down, okay? Um, but a lot of times they treat it like in older folks, they treat with palliation and it usually doesn't kill patients, although in uncontrolled AIDS it can, but oftentimes patients die with it rather than other, but it's not like you can go do a big surgery and cure it because it's a virus, right? right. And so it can be multifocal because the virus is all those places. When, when AIDS patients get multifocal lesions, it's not usually because they've had metastases all over their skin. It's because the virus is popping up and making these vessels proliferate in all those places. So very strange tumor. It doesn't like grow and work the way that other cancers do. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a strange thing about it. Um, and then also, because, yeah, it's important to know that, that it's not managed by like wide, massive, aggressive surgery. Whereas angiosarcomas get heavy chemo sometimes, big surgeries, radiation, depending, very aggressive therapy, and often they're aggressive tumors. So the things that help me, if I see really prominent, like nasty atypia, that's going to make me worry about a spindled angiosarcoma, okay? And the other things, if I see something that looks like capacity in the head and neck of an old person, that's angiosarcoma until you prove to me with an HHV8 that it's actually capacity. Um, so that's a, a real important to make sure that to make that distinction. And now that we have the HHV8 stain, it's really easy to do because that stain is as close to 100% sensitive as you can, you can get. There are some other things that have HHV8, but in the vascular world, once you get a spindle thing like this, it's HHV8, you're dealing with capacity sarcoma basically. So, um, but uh, yeah, that's a, a pretty good example of capacity sarcoma. All right, any questions about that? No. And that's a lot of... A lot of stuff to consider with this one. It is a, it's a tricky tumor. And I think it used to be really problematic in the old days, like in the, and by old days, I mean like the, the late 80s and early 90s, because before, before we had the HHVA stain, before we had um, therapy for HIV, young, a young person with capacity sarcoma, you're giving them AIDS, basically. I mean, people didn't get capacity sarcoma unless they had AIDS. And it was a terrifying, deadly disease that had no treatment at the time. So I never thought about that. And then some people who had been practicing at that time told me, and I thought, whoa, it just gave me this like moment of perspective of now it's a kind of a curiosity and we got an easy way to diagnose it. But back then telling capacity apart from other things was the difference between giving someone a deadly, uncurable disease, which is, you know, really terrible, obviously. So, so thankfully with heart, we often, I don't often see it in the setting of AIDS anymore, but occasionally we'll see like newly diagnosed patients that that kind of had delayed diagnosis. All right, so let's see. This is case 10. All right, 34-year-old uh, female with a slow-growing trunk lesion. Let's see where the top of the skin is. Oh, let me wipe it off a little bit. Okay, so here's the skin surface up here. Here's our lesion down here. So what did you think uh, that this was? Uh, so it's a spindle cell lesion. Mm -hmm. It's definitely dissecting down into the subcutaneous fat. Yeah, um, way down, huh? Yeah. And um, looking at how it is, it's deeper than, more than superficial, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then down here, um, it has a little bit of a different pattern than the rest of it. Yeah, let's go over here. Yeah. It does. Um, so, yeah, it kind of has a, a variety of different appearances. Like the cellularity is a lot more down right. here, right? And it's kind of almost making fascicles a little bit, kind of vaguely making fascicles. Over here, it gets much more like kind of fibrous and collagenous and less cellular. Some areas are solid, some areas have fat in it. Right. All right, so what do you think it is? I thought this was a DFSP, and I was wondering if that part down there was a little bit different, was like a fibrosarcomatous transformation. Excellent job, very good. Definitely this is DFSP, and we haven't even looked at the cytology really yet, not much, right? But I'll tell you, this pattern, until you prove what else it is, DFSP has got to be on your list, and there are a few other things that can trap fat like this, but this is the fat trap and we're talking about for DFSP. Not like a little bit of, you know, pushing down the fat. We're talking about islands, clusters of fat stranded and squished in the middle of the tumor, right? And I wish I could go lower power to show you, but like, look, this is the person's normal skin. Epidermis, dermis, 
here, right around where the eccrine coils are, that's where the subcutis starts. The, the, the dermal subcutaneous junction is right around where the eccrine coils live. So if you ever have something that's all tumor and you can't tell it, once you see the eccrine coils, you know you're getting pretty close to the subcutis. So it's a nice, useful, um, normal histology clue. And then normally, the subcutis is fat, right? With the exception of the fibrous um, septa in between the lobules of adipocytes, which we often don't see big enough chunks of fat to be able to see those lobules. But then over here, you can see that the, this is all used to be subcutis, and it's been wiped out by tumor. This stuff here wasn't dermis. This was subcutis, and it's wiped out everything and only left a few little stranded adipocytes, or what's even more helpful, these clusters, little clumps of adipocytes that are being squeezed to death, right? They're just being choked out by the tumor. Okay, so that's the way I think it's so helpful is that the, the used to be pristine subcutaneous real estate wiped out and overrun by the spindle cells, okay? And the spindle cells of DFSP, down here is probably the best place, are thin, elongated, and bland. They look almost neural a lot of times, and it can be very easy to confuse this tumor with a, the diffuse type of neurofibroma, which also can intermingle with fat and also stains with what it's this tumor stain with again? Uh, so this will stain with CD34. CD34, right. And so do neurofibromas, by the way. So so if you need to tell them part, use an S100. I used to say you would never see S100 in a DFSP, but I have actually seen one case now confirmed with molecular that had patchy but strong S100 staining, which was really shocking. And it was a fibrosarcomatous DFSP. I just uh, saw that this year, actually. So that was totally mind-blowing for me. The more you do this stuff, you'll eventually see all the rules get broken. I think that's if you're a pathologist long enough. All the book pages will have exceptions on them. So, but the cells do not look atypical, right? And that's what sometimes people get confused. They see an ugly pleomorphic thing in the skin and they think could be DFSP. And that tells me they've never seen a DFSP before. Because DFSP do not have pleomorphism with the very, very rarest of case reportable exceptions. I've seen one time a case that was radiated and got some wild pleomorphism. And there was a case, I think, from Spain that got published that they confirmed, but it looked like a pleomorphic sarcoma, like UPS, but it was molecularly proven. So rare stuff happens, but for practical purposes, 99.99999% of these are going to be bland because they're translocation sarcomas, aren't they? So, and then the, we always teach that what these have is a, uh, a really striking swirled world story form pattern. But sometimes you can get kind of some vague fascicles. They really can run a range of features. When you get nice story form pattern, it's great. But you don't always have that. I mean, but look, would you ever look at a picture of this and think, oh, it's a sarcoma? No. no. It sure doesn't look malignant, right? So this is one of those, and it kind of looks neural. So when I'm thinking of a neural tumor or a perineurioma or something, and S100 is negative, and 34 is positive, I always think of DFSP. There are lots of other things that can look that way, like low fat spindle cell lipoma and a variety of other things. But when I have got a small biopsy and I see a 34 positive bland spindle cell thing and I can't really see the fat, I often will send those for fish to rule out DFSP. Because you know if most of the differential will be benign things, but if it's DFSP, they're gonna go do a huge surgery, either Mohs or a wide local excision with a couple centimeters of margin, big surgery. So um, even though these don't usually metastasize or cause the patient to die, which is good, they can be locally aggressive and the surgeries can be very morbid. And I, I'm in a couple of DFSP patient support groups on Facebook and I've seen the, the very dramatic scars these patients have and it really made me um, have a greater respect for this tumor. So, um, and then up here, I'll show you, you won't like it, but see, there's some collagen trapping. So even though we love that for DF, I definitely see DFSPs on a regular basis with a bit of collagen trapping. So. So that's nice to look for, but don't rely too heavily on it. But I think the one thing that would help me is these cells are very thin. And usually DFSP has more, I'm sorry, dermatofibromas have more plump, juicy, fat kind of cells, but not always. Some dermatofibromas have thin, spindly cells, and those are the times where CD34 can really help. And again, seeing if you see a whole, the whole lesion, it's easier. If you only see a superficial shave, though, be very wary because it's easy on a superficial biopsy to miss a diagnosis of dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. And now, uh, oh, and let's see where else is going to show. This is the other thing is as it snakes out, it trickles through the fat like this. And so it can be very difficult to assess margins on these, particularly at frozen. And I've done it before. The Mohs surgeon has uh, a handful of times I've sat with the Mohs surgeon. We've looked at margins and it can be challenging. But seeing that, that kind of bland spindle cells filling up spaces between the fat, that's tumor. Those are all tumor cells. And you might say, well, just do CD34 at the margins. Well, yeah, but 34 stains pretty much the normal background dermis. Some of the subcutis will stain with 34. So it's a much harder stain to interpret. What we really need is like a specific DFSP stain, but so far none is uh, has been discovered that I know of. So 
Over here, let's go to your question. I think that this probably does represent fibrosarcomatous transformation. The problem is that we only have a small area, but see right here, it's definitely more cellular than the rest of the tumor. And it's beginning to sweep into these fascicles. And the fascicles have, it's a little bit, you have to hallucinate a little bit, but they got a bit of a herringbone pattern. See how they're kind of running at sharp angles, kind of into each other, and they're flowing right. together. I don't know the right way to describe it visually, but uh, to me, that is certainly suspicious. So sometimes if I see, like say this was the biopsy, this is probably actually part of a bigger excision, if I recall. And, um, and there were more obvious areas elsewhere. But if I had a biopsy with just one area like that, I would probably say DFSP and with a comment that there's an area that's starting to get fascicular and I'm concerned it could be fibrosarcomatous, compare it with the excision specimen. The good news, they're gonna treat it the same way. They take it out with a margin and then we look at the whole excision specimen. And although the fibrosarcomatous uh, DFSPs are reported to have a bit of a higher risk of metastasis, something like 15% in most studies, not all, but most studies, uh, whereas regular DFSP is probably closer to like 2% or maybe less. I think I've only seen one DFSP that's metastasized and I've seen many, many DFSPs. So, um, so they do have a somewhat higher risk of METs, but the treatment to my knowledge is basically the same. But even in these higher grade areas, look, they're still pretty uniform looking cells. They're not, you're not gonna see wild pleomorphism. You may see a bit more mitotic activity, but they can be quite, um, quite subtle. All right, so that is dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans, a really nice example. And that's why they're so problematic is because they're just so infiltrated into the fat and you really got to go way around to get them out. And that leaves, of course, a huge scar for the patient. So, um, and they're clinically often misdiagnosed as like cysts and like uh, lipoma, scar. There's like a flattened form that looks like scar. So everyone, you, you learn them as being these multi-nodular protuberant uh, things, which is why we call them dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. But we actually did a study with the Facebook group where we had patients um, tell us what theirs looked like and how long it took to diagnose. And a lot of them presented as a flat plaque. And some of those never became nodular. They just stayed plaque-like. And then once they were finally biopsied years later, sometimes turned out to be DFSP, not a scar or a keloid or a birthmark or whatever they wow. had thought. So it's a really challenging uh, tumor um, to diagnose clinically and sometimes microscopically as well. And oh yes, we didn't talk. What is the molecular um, abnormality? So it's got a uh, collagen 1A1 and PGFB. Uh, fusion, which is Good. location 1722. Excellent. And that is what the vast majority have. But in the past couple of years, we've discovered that there's actually a second um, alternate fusion that involves PDGFD, PDGFD as in dog or Delta. So, um, and it can, I think there's a couple different things that might be able to fuse with, I'm not sure. But we um, actually, we, I've seen um, a, one case of that in my practice, and I'm working on writing up a, a report of that in partnering with someone else who had a case. Um, to, because there's only been, I don't know, I think maybe a dozen of them in the literature, or 10, but I, I think that they're probably out there because I've seen things that look like P, like DFSP, but were negative on fish. And thinking back now, I suspect probably some of those were, were those alternate fusion ones That's that we sure. just didn't know um, existed. So now what I do is uh, if I have a case like this, this is classic. There's no need to do fish. This is DFSP. We're done. So, I mean, honestly, don't really need to do CD34 for this. I, to me, I feel comfortable without it, but um but uh, if I, when I use the fish is particularly when I'm like, it's a, I've got a small biopsy of a spindle cell thing and I'm either pretty sure it's not the FSP, but it's bland and CD34 positive. And I'm either gonna tell them this is a benign thing, leave it alone or go back and do a huge surgery. Why not do the fish? It's not that expensive and it's a pretty good test. So that's when I'll use fish. Or again, when I've got a, a biopsy that I'm pretty sure is the FSP, but I can't really see any fat trapping because they just did a punch biopsy. I want to definitively prove it so they can go straight to definitive surgery. I feel like telling them, go back and get me a bigger biopsy. Sometimes that'll work, but other times it may not still solve the problem. And then we're now, after two biopsies are done, now we're still debating what to do. And I figure I'll just do the fish and a week later we got an answer. Okay. So for obvious cases, no problem, but for small biopsies or difficult cases, um, where, where you've done your 34 and it's positive and you're still not sure, the fish can be really helpful. And if I do, if I'm sus suspicious enough to do fish and it comes back as uh, negative for collagen 1A1 PDGFB, then I'll reflexively just go straight to do PDGFD just in case, uh, since I have seen that one. And that one I actually had a low index of suspicion for. I was like, it probably is not, but I didn't know what else to do with it. And I did the fish and I couldn't believe that it was positive. So it was a real learning lesson for me and very humbling. All right, well, that's a marathon of 10 cases. Any questions? No, thank you. Appreciate All right, that. Terrence, thanks so much. You did an awesome job, man. Good work.